Hello and welcome to the Writer's Mindset Podcast with me, Ellie Betts. Christina is still hiding away, hard at work on our new patron exclusive series, Healthy Habits. We're here to create a community of authors who persevere, are their most productive selves, and publish at a speed that they are comfortable with. This week, we both had a chat with Gudrun Lorette to discuss local history and using stories in your work. Goodwin is a copywriter and content marketer who helps businesses to make the most of their best content. History is her real passion, though, and she joined us to share some spooky stories, local tales, and content ideas. I do want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons for your support. We couldn't do this without you. This week, we have a new patron, Nicole Matthews. Thank you so much for joining us and for signing up for our patron. As a patron, you get early access to episodes, bonus content, and our undying gratitude for supporting all of the work that goes into creating these episodes to inspire and motivate you. And as I mentioned, Christina has been working on a Patreon exclusive series called Healthy Habits. We've had some great feedback for it so far. It is definitely worth checking out. Just popping in to let you know there's a new episode of Healthy Habits out now. The series is all about the techniques I use to manage my chronic health issues so that I can get more done and not feel like shit all the time. Because let's face it, that's how most of us with chronic illnesses feel on a regular basis. So far, we've covered brain training, the best types of movement for us desk-obsessed writers, and our latest episode is all about the foods that will boost your focus. You could get exclusive access to this new series on Patreon for as little as £3 a month. Just think. The price of one coffee a month could completely change your quality of life. That may sound melodramatic, but I wouldn't be sharing these techniques with you if they hadn't already made a huge difference to my fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and more. These tips are designed to boost your memory, help you focus, and even improve your resilience. If you want to start adopting healthier habits today, come join us over on patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. Joining Ellie and me today on the Writer's Mindset is our good friend Gudrun Lorette. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be here again. So for our lovely writers who haven't checked out our previous interview with you on um, how to get into content marketing, can you just share a little bit about who you are and what you do, please? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm Gudrun. I have been a published writer for 25 years this year. I started out writing for Waterstones Bookshop. They used to have a magazine. So that my first blog, a uh, blog, um, book review was published in 1997 when I was 14. So I've just given away my age there. But, you know, I'm getting old and my brain's starting to go. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I started off doing. Um, and I wrote constantly after that. And then seven years ago, I decided to be a copywriter and content marketer. And I help businesses of all sizes and in all sectors to write blogs, to create podcasts, show notes, uh, social media posts. I write white papers, pretty much anything that's that's written content that somebody wants, um, I'll do that. I help people come up with ideas if they're new to content marketing, um, give them some pointers on the sorts of things they should be doing, helping them to think about it. Uh, what they're writing from an audience perspective rather than from themselves yeah it's very varied which is great it's a lot of fun and yeah, it's uh it's been my it was always my dream to be a, a writer and now I am excellent that's quite the list of experience there very impressive Thank you. Uh, today though uh, we are talking about local history mm-hmm. how did you get into local history Goodwin? I don't think it's fair to say I got into it I think it's always been there I was um, I've been really lucky to have been born and brought up in two different cities where local history is everywhere. So I spent my early childhood in York, where there is history everywhere. Obviously, we've got the Jorvik Viking Centre, which is really famous. But of course, there was also um, there was the Romans as well. So um, Ibarakum was the Roman name for York. Just you can't go anywhere in York without falling over history. You've got the very famous shambles with the leaning buildings. You've got Clifford's Tower, which was the scene of a terrible massacre. And of course, there's a lot of ghost walks, which I did when I was a kid. So should you ever want a ghost tour of York, 
uh, pay twelve pounds to the strange man in the hat. I'll do it for you. And then yes, my yep. yes. <laughs> just completely lost Ellie and I on the like ghost tour yes, thing because that's a that's bucket list thing for both of us. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'll I'll do it. I'll do it for you, and uh, and then you don't have to uh, you don't have to pay the the weird guy. And uh, <laughs> they always they always start and end at the pub, so we can uh, we can do that. So obviously a lot that's of the, to do a walk, I think. Yeah. I oh, think yeah. that's the only way to do anything, really, start and end at the pub. That's true. But um a lot of a lot of the pubs are haunted in York. So you you know, they they often pick a, a pub where there's gonna be a ghost story attached to that. And then my parents are both from from the northeast of England, from Gateshead, which is south of the line. And we all have we have full of history here too. I think people think that Newcastle is a party city and there's not much much going on other than come to the pubs so or you go to the metro centre to do the shopping. There's actually a ton of history. Um, you know, we have a big Roman Roman history ourselves. We have on either side of the Tyne we have a former barracks and um, Roman camps. We've obviously got the very Famous Hadrian's Wall, which was what were commenced 1900 years this year on Hadrian's Wall. So, uh, so we've got we've got that. Um, we have the Newcastle, which the city was named for. That was built by Robert Curtis, who was the son of William the Conqueror. So, uh, after he'd after he'd won the Battle of Hastings, William sent. One of his sons north because he couldn't control the Northmen from from down in London. Um, how well he did is up for debate. Um, so we have we have the um, the castle, and we've we've got Tudor buildings. We've got the history of the the time, the shipbuilding, we've got the mines. We've got a whole lot of industry, and you know. Actually, now you've got me started, I could go on forever. But there's there's so much to see and, and do in the northeast, and I think it's a shame that not more is known about it. Um, I'm so to jealous. Come. Yeah, Where I grew up had fuck all. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah me too. It's me doing too. more now that I've left. I'm not even joking. <laughs> Something you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really. Most of the places I've been, most of the places I've lived don't really have anything like that like but Nottinghamshire has around. stuff right Actually, like as a county castle, has stuff castle yeah. in Nottingham was built by someone from Newcastle oh well, there really? you go you see I can't remember his name but in the no, like the original castle or the stately home thingy that's there as a castle well I just I'm using air quotes for questions, listeners so I don't know uh, <laughs> yeah we have a couple of, of famous builders from from up here um We've got William Armstrong, who was known as the magician of the North. He built Cragside, um, which had uh, like he had elect- like not electricity, but he had lights before there were indoor lights. He had a heated shower that he'd built himself. So there was there was William Armstrong, um, and then obviously uh, Richard Granger, who built Granger Town. John Dobson, who was his actively the street planner for the local authority. So there was there's a lot of, of famous builders here. We also invented the light bulb with Joseph Swan. We invented the minus safety lamp, the Georgie lamp. Not we personally, not all of us, but uh, and of course we've got the uh, Stevenson's rocket, the which was the locomotive engine. So, so yeah, there's a lot of building stuff goes on went on here as well. And that was a long winded answer to your question. Is that I didn't it, I have a choice you know local history was was just everywhere we used to get in a car on a Sunday and my dad would drive up to the Northumberland coast where we've got castles all the way along because obviously we were in a strategic position so there were there were castles built all the way up the coast to defend from the Scandinavians from anybody who might try and sneak around the side but yeah so so history is is everywhere and I was just immersing it my entire life really now I get why I wasn't into history growing up because we didn't have any of that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I definitely didn't have much around me. It was learning about it in school that got me into history. Oh, um, we didn't even get that at school. Like, uh, because of the way it was taught at our school, aside from the ancient Greeks, none of it engaged me enough. And, like, 
even when you mention local history to where I grew up, they're like, we made ribbons. There's this ornament thing by an island that no one knows what it means, but it's meant to have something to do with ribbons. And there was a bunch of miners. And that's pretty much all people can tell you. That's it. Hmm. Whereas like in Nottingham, there's so much in comparison. And I just think that's really cool. Like it's not just the castle and the stuff that you see. It's the stuff you don't like the history of the lace market and the old buildings and the things that happened there and the way those buildings look because they're really old and they were factories like with the high ceilings that make it bloody freezing inside. You know, I just think that's really interesting. We just didn't have those things where I was. Yeah, yeah. old industrial towns are always interesting, I think. The place I went to that had the most well-preserved local history was actually um, Boston in the US because every little thing that had any relation to history, they really preserved. Even though they had like 500 years of it, you can go, they've got like um, red bricks built into the path around the whole city. So you can buy a little like guidebook for $2 and go around the whole city and visit all these historical sites. And it's got information in there. And a couple of them you have to pay to go in, but most of it's free. And it's just, everything is right there for you. It's surrounded by these obviously much more modern buildings, but they really did do well at preserving it. And all the Boston Tea Party stuff, things like that. It's really cool. Binge watching Rizzoli and Isles and they haven't mentioned that in seven seasons, which baffles me because they're so cool. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Disappointing. Um, <laughs> do you have then um, a local history story that's your favourite? Do you have one that uh, you really enjoy retelling? Yeah, I have a couple. I mean, what I like is anything sort of quirky or gruesome. We've got quite a nice little story about um, a young woman in the 1770s called Betsy Surtees. And she is famous for having eloped with her lover. She escaped from a bedroom window one night. Um, her dad disapproved of him. And you can still visit um, Betty Surtees' house, which is um, a perfectly preserved Jacobean building. The story's not quite that exciting because actually her dad went, oh, you know what? He's all right. You can marry him after all. Um, he went on to become quite successful. So that's a nice little local story that, that has a bit of excitement, but there's not much to it. So my favourite, I think, is, is one from the Victoria Tunnel. So the Victoria Tunnel is an underground network of wagonways and the link former um, heads around the, the north of the Tyne. And the idea was that to make it easier to transport the coal was to take it underground. So there's all there's a series of, of tunnels. Some of them uh, are still accessible and you can do a tour. So the idea is that up in the what are now the suburbs of Newcastle, you could bring the coal down. And they weren't actually used for very long because the mine, uh, the mine went out of business. But when it was still open, the guy who owned it decided he was going to sell it. And he arranged for uh, a tour for prospective buyers. And he said, you know, I'm going to be going down to the mine. It's going to be me and the foreman and we're going to be taking these, these prospective buyers into the mine to have a look around. So what he wanted was to have plenty of space to do this. He forgot to mention it to the site gaffer and said, I forgot to say, please don't do any mining today. So they had to get a message to say, um, you know, don't, don't do any mining. And the message came too late. So they'd already gone down into the mine to start their tour. And the, the foreman said to basically to move everything through the mine you have a, a wagon and you have a little lad at the front who, who steers and can see and a little lad at the back whose job is basically to push you off and to, to help with unloading at the other end so he said to the two little lads he said you know just go through the mine and just make sure that there's, there's nobody around and just make sure that they're aware that there's going to be this this tour and don't let anybody through so the little lad, all right right so to get there you have to go on the wagon so the little lad starts running and he runs up behind the wagon. And what he has to do is he has to push the wagon really hard and jump on the back. Except he slips and falls and pushes the wagon off. And the wagon goes hurtling through the darkness. And the little lad's on the floor crying because he's, you know, a small boy, so he skinned his knees. And the wagon hurtles through the darkness, through the tunnels. And the guy who's trying to sell his mine hears the rumbling. And one of them throws himself to the ground so he's on the tracks. One of them jumps out of the way and 
hits himself against the wall. The other one is basically just knocked over and crushed. So this is just, you know, it's just, just one of those a sequence of ridiculous events that, you know, lack of communication, a little boy falling over leads to um, a fatality, uh, you know, a life-changing injuries because this guy's had his legs broken, he's paralysed and the mine is not going to be sold. And I just, I love that because I like this idea that these ridiculous deaths used to happen in Victorian times all the time because, you know, they didn't know that things were dangerous or, you know, that people be constricted into, um, you know, whalebone corsets and things like that. And I just, I find that hilarious. And it's very sad, very sad, but it makes me laugh. And I would like to write a book one day where I collect ridiculous Victorian deaths. And I think that would be, uh, that would be top of the, the list is, you know, a small boy resulting in the death of, you know, a grown man and paralyzing another one. And it's a quite dark story, but it, it makes me laugh. But yeah, and you can hear it yourself if you go on the tour. If you're not claustrophobic, you can do the tour of the tunnels and, and hear the story. No, no, we'll not be going <laughs> down there. No, the hill's like in the air. Like open air are bad enough. Going like in a dark cave down here. No, just no. Yeah. Used it as an air raid shelter during the during the war and people were packed in like sardines. Oh there. Yeah. Cause at least like the caves in Nottingham, they're actually surprisingly airy, at least the ones you can tour. It surprised me how big they were because I've been in other caves like the Hellfire Caves in somewhere down south. I've forgotten what they're called. Somewhere down south. Ha, it begins with a H. I can't remember. Anyway, I've been in those and my mum and I had to leave because we were getting so claustrophobic. But I never felt like that in the Nottingham ones. And I guess that's why people lived in them for so long. Yeah. Like, literally, I, what, was it the 1920s, Ellie, that people stopped living in the Muslim thing? I don't think it was as recent as that, but I can't remember, to be honest. But they, they've, with the refurb of the castle, they've actually opened up more of the caves now. They've, like, kids with them out so they're all safe. Because there's loads of them, because the castle's, like, on the edge of a hill kind of thing. And the whole hill's made of Nottingham sandstone. So all along the bottom, there's these doors that were just locked. But they go up into the castle, into places. Wow. Um, there's like a whole network of them there's only one that you could actually go down that was sort of made safe with like a railing and stuff that you could go down and there's like a whole story of what happened in there but the other ones were never really went into but there's a load of them that are now open to go into I believe I don't know if you've been to Nottingham Goodrun but there's a, a lot of bars in the city centre and all the toilets are downstairs in caves what oh, really I didn't know that either <laughs> yeah. I've only been for market at live and Admittedly, a lot of that is in the bars, but <laughs> we, did, we haven't had much of an opportunity to tour Nottingham. Um, so, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Mm, it's really yeah. cool. Uh, and obviously, it's very cool, physically cool down there yeah. because, <laughs> of the, because of the caves. Yeah. Can't believe yeah. It, Christina. I don't know why. I, I know a lot of them use um, the caves to store booze because of the fact it's cooler down there. Um, so they're quite good storage facilities and have been for like centuries. But I actually haven't been to the oldest pub in Nottingham and I've been in Nottingham a decade. See, that one is actually built into the side of the rock. So like the back of the pub isn't a wall, it's sandstone. Oh. Um, Why haven't I built in? been there? Then again, I've not been to the castle either. You're just not as cool as I thought you were, clearly. No. Okay. I'm just yeah, a hermit. Come out now. I'm just a hermit, you know. <laughs> like, here's the ideal place for you. Yeah, true. That's true. That's <laughs> true. I mean, they have nice drinks in there as well and food. Do they? It's actually a decent pub. Although, was that the one that was struggling due because of COVID, or was it the other really old one? I don't know. I can't remember. I imagine all of them were, to be honest. Yeah, fair point. <laughs> fair point. Do you ever incorporate your historical knowledge into your client work, Gudrun? And if so, how do you do that? Um, not for most of my clients. I've done some work for, you'll know Natalie Pithis, who's a genealogist. So I've helped her with some of her stuff. Um, and I do bring in things that I have learned. So, um, you know, she has podcasts on particular themes. So I have used my own knowledge of things that I've gleaned and sort of brought that in to enhance her, her stories. But yeah, unfortunately, most of my work is 
it's B2B and there's not a lot of scope, sadly, to do that. Um, but I am working on it. So you never know. I might I might get the opportunity to, to do more of that in the future. Fingers crossed. You need to write that book. I need to write that <laughs> book, yeah. <laughs> We well, need to read it and our writers need it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I'm definitely buying that book. I was going to ask if you had any really cool stories, really interesting stories or good examples of ones that you would like to use in something, maybe not necessarily a book, but definitely the book um, that you haven't really found a home for yet. I think it would be nice to see more stories about the Northeast. I feel quite strongly about it when I go places and they say you're from Newcastle they always just look a bit pityingly I think because for, certainly for the last 60 years you know um, you know with the closure of the shipyard about 60 years I mean a friend of mine from college went to work at the shipyard before it closed so, you know the last 20 years the shipyards have closed the uh, mines have obviously closed down um, of Thatcher I think there's an idea there's not really a lot going on and I just I would love to see more more stories about the northeast that brings in the history because I think what tends to happen is people come to Newcastle say they're coming through the airport or they come through the um, airport and they'll either go up to Edinburgh or they'll go off to the Lake District which obviously both have amazing uh, histories as well and I think it's a shame that people don't not as many people would stop here as Say you'd get in York as tour, you know, if you're always falling over a tourist in York. I think I think it would be nice to have a little bit of a, a timeline, you know, just to go around Newcastle and say, actually, if you if you spend a little bit of time here, you can go back to I mean the place where we first lived when we moved back up here as a place called the Summerhill, which nobody would ever find. And there was a big you'd go up the hill and there was a big Fields, farmers fields and there was a huge hole in the farmers field where they dug out um, a bronze age coffin and there'd been a couple buried in this bronze age coffin I don't even know what happened to the coffin or the or the couple but you know it's there's history everywhere so I think I think it'd be nice to have you know an illustrated book or something that that sort of captures all of the different things and here south of the river there's a lot of things that people aren't aware of you know we have some really terrible um, mining disasters but there was a lot of a lot of stuff going on like I said Joseph Swan who was one of the contenders for inventing the light bulb he was south of the river but yeah I think there's a lot of stories that deserve to be brought to light we've got the um, Shipley Art Gallery we've got Saltwell Park south of the river which were um, founded by local um, Victorian philanthropists not enough has known about them so yeah if there was a way of, of writing a book or creating something to bring that to life that, that would be nice I think do you have any good examples of pop culture whether that's a film a tv show a book series or whatever maybe even a game that has used history to inspire the world building the characters the plot because I, I suppose if you're using history to inspire it it's everything it's not it's not just one aspect of it isn't it yeah i mean i think i think anybody who writes uh novels about the northeast is always it's inspired by the history and the landscape the um the author lj ross all of her books are centered around around the northeast she she brings that in obviously we've got the awful vera which is Anne Cleves, I think, is the author. Sorry, Anne, but Vera, the TV series, is horrible. That, you know, that's drawing in um, local area, local history. But I think I'm more interested in how uh, history, historical sites stay relevant. I think that's that's a more interesting thing. So that was what I was thinking of when I considered this question. So one of my favourite things, if you saw it during the lockdown, was the curator battle. And that was started by the Yorkshire Museum. And it ran every Thursday and Friday, I think, during the first lockdown. And what they did was basically they had a, a theme of the week and they shared something from their collection uh, as an example of the theme. And then any other museum or gallery or site from around the world could join in. So it was it was really good fun because this this went, you know, went viral. Um it was a really fun way of bringing things out of the collection. But it was also quite fun to see how people interpreted the theme. 
So, uh, so, so it was on um, birds. So they, uh, you know, the the Yorkshire Museum might have a, kind of a stuffed bird, and then you've got the British Museum, which would have an ancient carving of a bird. And then you'd get, you know, you'd get some gallery in, in America go, well, actually, I think we win this week because we've got this, which is really famous. It got interaction from all over the world, which was nice. The curators got a bit competitive. The audience got to got to vote on their favourite each week and vote on a theme for the following week. And I think it was a really nice way to highlight the collections when the, when the museums were closed. And I think the York Castle Museum has a has a guess the object thing, which sort of follows on from that. So here is a random object. It's your your best wrong answers for what this is. So I think I think that's what I like is, is the sites continuing to influence pop culture by getting onto social media and, and sharing their, their artifacts. Where was it you know, there, the creative battle? What was it on? It was on Twitter. It was a hashtag. Oh, it's a Twitter thing. Oh, yeah, cool. so you can still find it now, um, and they bring it back every now and again. It's quite good. And obviously, from a sort of local history point of view, you know, some of the living museums, which like the Black Country Museum, are sharing something that's very specific to their local area that fits in with the theme. So, so it was it was nice. I really I really liked it. So I always it always amuses me when when that happens or when um, you know there's a significant event and museums and galleries jump on it so like back in I think it was 2019 there was a heat wave and Winchester Cathedral have got an Anthony Gormley um, sculpture and they took a photo of him and it looked like he was checking his phone for the weather and it said yep still a heat wave even in Winchester Cathedral it's still a heat wave so I like that I like this I like that because it you know people think museums and art galleries are stuffy and and boring but actually not They're, they're run by people like everything else and I like the fact they do something fun and light-hearted to get people talking that's so cool that's so I love going to museums when I um there's a there's a really cool one in um Oxford which I imagine might have taken part because they have a lot of cool things that they could have um substituted for that at the Ashmolean Museum it's just I yeah, go there every time there. I go to Oxford and it's I just feels like a little happy place but a lot of museums feel like that to me because I'm a big nerd. Yeah, I went there. I went. <laughs> it's just quite embarrassing. I went there on a tour when I was 12 as a guest of the Sherlock Holmes Appreciation Society. Wow. That's so cool. That, this is like the cool. best podcast to say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. My um, my grandfather had um, all of the Sherlock Holmes stories, unfortunately, what he had was a book like that with the 56 short stories and then a companion, one of the four the four longer ones. So not ideal for casual reading, but I, I got them. And so when I was, for Christmas, when I was 11, I asked for a membership to two of the, two of the Sherlock Holmes Appreciation Society. So and, my, and my parents obliged because my parents are nuts, obviously, you know. I mean, anything to do with reading and history, my parents would, would indulge me. Um, you know, we went to we went to Whitby to run all the sites after I'd read Robin Jarvis's Whitby Witches. We did that as a family. We read the book and then we went to Whitby and, and all the locations. But this one, yeah, my parents went step further. And after they bought me the, this membership, it turned out that I was the youngest ever member of this this organization and they invited me down to their annual dinner the AGM so we drove down from Newcastle to Oxford and got hopelessly lost because we always get hopelessly lost and we arrived I arrived at the dinner so I remember my dad dropping me off in the porter just going you know she's she's 12 she's not a student here She's not a member of Oxford University. And my dad said, no, no, she's, she, I've just let her in. And I was so late, I'd missed the dinner. So I was starving. And I got there in time for the thing. But I had my dessert. And then they do, uh, I can't remember what it is, but Holmes and Watson have um, have these pseudonyms that they use when they're doing certain missions. And at the, uh, the end of the AGM, they do a toast to whatever Holmes and Watson's the name is and a certain gracious lady which is queen victoria and they said oh you can do the toast <laughs> and there was me and i 
50, 70 year old academics, you can imagine, in some random part of Oxford University. And I was asked to give, give the toast to Queen Victoria. And uh, then we did a tour of the Ashmolean Museum. So, so yeah, that's uh, an embarrassing claim to fame, which amuses my mother no end to this I day. I think that's great. <laughs> what, a, what a fucking cool 12 year old. Jeez, I was so, awesome. You wonder why I was unpopular at school. That was why. <laughs> We're lucky we do have, so we've got Beamish, which is a living museum, and that's been expanding over the last 30, 40 years. So they've got loads and loads of stuff now. But we also, a lot of the sites, we have a lot of reenactors over the summer. And we used to, you know, when we were at school, we did all of the, we were always being dragged off on a school trip to some stately home or we've got um, to a lighthouse or whatever you want climb up the stairs lighthouse so yes we were always we were always doing that we, you know that was a here's an outing from school we're going to a, a state and I suppose I was lucky that I was interested in it maybe everybody else wasn't and you know all they wanted to do was get into the shop and buy one of those novelty rubbers in the shape of a book which I really like as it happens um you know but there was lots of scope for that and I think maybe we were just because we've got so much stuff going on that it's a it's an easy way to entertain the kids for an afternoon yeah and I think if you don't know it's there or you don't know where to start looking that's when you don't bother right so where would you say the best places to learn local history are I would say the library uh the library's got to be your first port of call we've got um Newcastle City Library which has been a sort of a leading resource for years they've obviously the librarians know everything. They've got a, a local history department. Um, so you can go and ask thing, for things. You can access the papers. The librarians will know stuff. And we also have tourist information within that. So the tourist information is part of the library. So you can go and, and pick up leaflets in there. We also have the, um, the Lit and Phil, the Literary and Philosophical Society. It's one of the oldest private members libraries in the country. Um, which interestingly was founded as a as a library for the public. So obviously, libraries weren't originally for the general public, but this was a you know to give uh, access to you know newspaper reading room and stuff to locals, and that's also haunted. So uh, yeah, the Lit and Phil is great. They have I'm, I'm a member. Don't borrow the books. I just go to sit and feel clever and use their Wi-Fi. I am a, a member but they have lectures on so anywhere like that you'll find out about um about you know things of interest we went to one it was about the history of religion on hadrian's wall so all of the you know bringing all the the roman gods into the the local area and where all the legionaries had come from so that was really interesting this is an opportunity to do a, a walk like a ghost walk or a bus tour i know edinburgh just the they've got a Ghosty bus thing. Um, I did a um, ghost walk in Edinburgh recently, actually, and it was very good. I bet it was really good. I haven't done it, but I would. Uh, yeah, I keep I keep seeing those those black double deckers with the skeletons, and I think, oh, it, it wasn't the bus one. It was walking one. Yeah, and we walked up this biggest fucking hill I've ever seen in my life, and I almost died. But <laughs> it was well worth it because, in my experience, the people doing these things tend to be really charismatic and really into the subject, don't they? Yeah, they so they sort of sell it to you on that alone. They make it engaging, I think. Um, but I would listen to someone drone on about local history. So yeah, I would. I would. I mean, I'm normally droning myself, so you know. <laughs> we actually analysed the way that a guy who does local ghost story tours. Um, speaks as part of my storytelling class at uni it was really weird because like our very first storytelling lesson we were analyzing a video of this guy and then our very last night at uni we saw him in person doing a ghost walk like literally he was on the opposite side of the street to us and we'd never seen him before even on all the nights out we've been on all the times we've walked around the city and we saw him on this one last maybe he's night. the ghost <laughs> did you go tell you a lot actually him- did you give your feedback on what you thought of his talk? <laughs> no, we'd forgotten three years later. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he's very charismatic and he's in a lot of local, not even local actually, he's in a lot of um, British crime and historical documentaries as one of the experts. Mm. I've forgotten his name, so don't ask me, but I can picture his face anyway. I was just going to ask what's his name. <laughs> 
So as you will probably remember, good friend, last time you were here, uh, we asked you which book changed your life. And I believe you cheated and gave us two. Um, I would like me. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a slightly different question for you today, which is which one historical story changed your life? Or had a big impact on your life, I suppose. So I had a good think about this because it's hard to pick just one. So I thought if you'll indulge me, I'll give you a family history story. Um, cheating again. Cheating again, <laughs> which I very, I very, very rarely do. I don't, I don't do family history. Um, uh, we'll allow it, we'll allow it. So this is a, it's basically this story is, uh, is about my grandmother. And the reason it changed my life is because depending on how things had gone, none of us would have been here. Oh, I like so, that take on it. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, so if, if, if things had gone the way they were supposed to, she wouldn't have been here and none of her children would have been here and some of her grandchildren would have been here. So um, my, my, my nana was born um, just down the road from where I live now in a, a little community right on the banks of the river and she was... Uh, her family were shipyard builders. Uh, so Bilkey is known for the shipbuilding, and then there are a lot of mines. So people on this side of the river, their families are either shipbuilders or, or miners. Uh, her family were Jewish. And so during the war, the, the adults were very concerned about the, uh, about the safety of the children. So she and her um, younger brother were evacuated up to um, Northumberland. And they decided that, uh, the family decided that that wasn't safe enough um, because they were, they were Jewish children, but they were also from a wealthy family. The family were actually the shipyard owners. So the decision was taken to send them overseas to have them evacuated. And the plan was that they would go from Liverpool uh, to Canada. And the ship they should have been on was the uh, the SS City of Benares, which went from Liverpool in 1940. So my nana would have been 13 or 14, and her brother was about 9 or 10, um, her Uncle Bob. And the plan was they go to Liverpool from Newcastle, and they bought the steamer. And I don't know what happened. She was She's never been clear about what it was that happened. The decision was made not to send them to Canada, but to send them to Australia. And they went on the SS Battery instead. And so the two ships left Liverpool at the same time, the City of Benares for Canada and the Battery to, uh, to Australia, to, to Perth. And as they were coming out of the harbour, the, the Germans bombed the ship. And what they did was they bombed city of Benares and killed almost every person on board, all the children, um, all the the, uh, the adults who were accompanying them, all of the crew. And the ships also, because it was a huge um, passenger liner, they also transported troops. So all of the troops, the majority of the troops were killed as well. And the ship to Australia went on its merry way. And it was after that that they actually stopped evacuating. So evacuating overseas uh, at, that, at that scale didn't last very long. So, um, so yeah, so had, had things gone as planned, she and Bob would have been intended to be evacuated to Canada and not made it outside of Liverpool docks. Uh, there's a book called The Singing Ship uh, by a woman called Mita McQueen, and she went on the ship as a young woman as a chaperone. And she actually wrote the book. And somewhere, I've been looking for it. It isn't in here. I did manage to track down a copy uh, when I was in Australia. I got two copies and I gave one to my nana and I kept one for myself. And it's, it's somewhere here. I'm looking around my office because I've got books here, but it's not here. But yeah, so the story of that journey um, was is told in this this book, which you can buy. It's quite hard to get a, get a hold of. You know, my nana's experiences on the ship, she, was a, she used to sleepwalk. She had to have a soldier posted outside of her cabin. She didn't go overboard. And so she went, she went, uh, you know, took a really long time to get there. And they went to um, Ceylon, as Sri Lanka was then, and uh, it stopped and met some governor. And then they, they bombed the port. And so the soldiers who they'd left behind were killed. 
when when they went on the boat back to Australia and her experiences in Australia weren't happy. Um, that's another story. But I think I think as a as a, a historical story that's changed my life. I think that's uh, that's quite a good one. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, can't really top that's that. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. I can't believe that. That's what luck to uh, to yeah. the off chance. To, well, I don't know if it's on the off chance, but to, to have that decision made to jump over to the other ship and then just keep... And they must have been able to see it as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, they did, yeah. It's just watching the ship they were meant to be on go up in flames, presumably. That's horrifying. Mm. Wow. Definitely changed your life. Yeah. Any other batshit historical stories that you really love and haven't shared with us? Because we just really like the batshit stories. <laughs> Extra points if there are ghosts in it. Oh, and the ghost walk guy is called Richard Felix, by the way. And he still does tours around Derby. Ah, I'm trying to think. I mean, yeah, because we just, I mean, what we have in the Northeast, we just have, you know, crackpot inventors inventing things and everything goes boom. When you're in Newcastle and you're on the Deeside, there is a story that my dad told, and I've never been able to find it cited anywhere else other than my father's extremely vivid imagination. But when you're on the side it's obviously down at the bottom and then you go up into Newcastle city centre so you can either walk up um, past the guild hall and you go up what's called the side and you go up this really big steep hill called Bean Street which is a killer or if you're um, you know particularly sadistic you can go up some steps there are several flights of steps from the quayside up to Newcastle, there's one flight of stairs that takes you to the castle keep, which every young woman in Newcastle has staggered up and down in heels um, and regretted their, their life choices. There are also some that you really can't see. Very, you can't. They're not obvious when you look at the buildings. And there is a story of of one of them where if you go up in the dark, particularly if you're a young man, you hear rustling of a lady's silk skirts and they call her the silky. If she likes you, she's nice to you, but otherwise she might push you down the stairs. So oh it's all sorts of story, yeah. Um, I, I've never been able to find that story anywhere other than my father. It's possible he's made it up, but yeah, there are quite a lot of ghost stories in in Newcastle City Centre. They're not as well known as the ones in, in York. You know, I could tell you six ghost stories from you from york now you know, off the top of my head without even thinking about it do you have time to share a quick york ghost story with us so, yeah there's a couple so there's um if you uh so if you go to york there's a, a pub called marmaduke's and the ladies toilets is haunted and that is haunted by a uh, a young man called Marmaduke, hence the name of the bar, and my dad, who, again, is a bit of an exaggerator, says that he, uh, he went there with a girlfriend. And he was, my dad went to York University. Marmaduke basically uh, lived in, in the pub before it was a pub. And what was his room is now the ladies' toilet. And Marmaduke was lame, and he was... Um, bleed and you know treated really badly and poor Marmaduke had such a terrible life that he hanged himself and so Marmaduke's ghost haunts the lady's toilet and my dad reckons that he went there with a the girlfriend and she went upstairs to use the loo and Marmaduke appeared before her and she was so startled she fainted. Now I think that's probably an exaggeration on um, my dad's part but is is haunted and um, people, people do see uh, Marmaduke and it's one of the ones that you hear on the ghost tour. There's a back lane um, off one of the side streets called the Burden and it, it, that's sometimes that's on the ghost tour as well and it has such an unpleasant atmosphere. We used to remember in the, the late 80s and early 90s when you could just leave your children unattended in cars outside pubs. So my, my dad used to leave us in the car um, and the pub was on the corner and the burn was behind us and it just has such an unpleasant atmosphere. And the story of the burden is that there was a, a guy who, um, who ran a children's home and he basically just mistreated the children. And in actual fact, what he did was... 
he abused them so badly they tended to die or they were neglected. And so basically under the burden is just the, the skeletons of, of all these children. And people say that if you walk there at night, you can hear the, the children crying. And it has got a really, really unpleasant atmosphere. You can maybe I think that because I know that, but you can you can sense that it's you know it's not a very nice place. But that that part of York is, is really haunted. Well, I look forward to our little personal tour then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one last little question then where yeah. can our listeners go to find out more about you Goodwin uh, you can come and have a look at my history blogs on my website I've got some uh, a series of local history blogs about the northeast I've got my uh, history of myself in 100 objects that's um, a little project I did a year or so ago I've got some podcast episodes um, about history and uh, books that aren't history related that are content marketing copywriting or you can come and talk to me on Twitter just at Gudrun Lorette that's as much social media as I can manage but yeah on Twitter you can find me there excellent lots of inspiration to be found on your website I imagine I hope so <laughs> perfect well that's all we have for you today thank you so much for joining us and just blowing us away with very cool ghost stories well thank you for having me and uh, thank you for letting me ramble on about about local history because that was fun it was great. I think we should just book in more appointments and just chat about local history and not even record it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That'll do. <laughs> Sounds good to me. If you enjoy The Writer's Mindset, we'd be super grateful if you could leave us a rating or review on the podcast platform of your choice. Or a thumbs up if you're joining us on YouTube. It really helps other writers to find us so that we can help them achieve their wildest writing dreams too. And don't forget to check out Goodwin's website. She has a lot of cool historical content on there that is packed full of inspiration. If you'd like early access to our episodes, the chance to submit questions for our guests, and to listen to that new bonus series, Healthy Habits, come and join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. We have a lot of big things planned, but we can't do them without your support. Every little thing helps us to help you more, whether it's a rating, review, or becoming a patron. We'll see you next time. Keep writing!